Stephanie asked me to talk about um, how we uh, mostly at AVO, but increasingly in the USGS are using infrasound as a monitoring tool. Um, so I, I put together this talk and it's really, uh, it's not gonna show a lot of cool science results, but it's gonna be more the, the nuts and bolts of, of how we use infrasound um, as, a, as a monitoring and research tool in the USGS. Uh, and I should say that there's a, there's a big group of us uh, in the USGS, particularly in Alaska, that are working in infrasound. Uh, and that includes David Fee, um, who is AVO, but also University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Matt Haney at AVO, Hans Schweiger at AVO, Wes Thielen, who's at the Cascade Vol Volcano Observatory, and uh, Aaron Weck at AVO. Uh, so just some basics about infrasound. I, I know I think a lot of people are familiar, but I'm going to try to cover all the bases here for those maybe not so familiar with infrasound. Um, it's, it's a low frequency wave that propagates in the atmosphere. Uh, similar to seismic, uh, we look at very simple things like the amplitude of the signal, the duration of the signal, the frequency of the signal. Uh, when we're when we're monitoring infrasound, usually the energy is between about 0.5 uh, and 20 hertz. 20 hertz is the upper limit. That's the the cutoff between infrasound or sound that humans can't hear uh, and and sound that we can hear. Uh, certainly, larger eruptions produce more low frequency energy. Um, so if you have a very large, like a subplinian or a plinian eruption, you can have energy down to uh, 10 seconds or or even lower. Um, but this is the typical volcano band, 0.5 to 20 hertz. Uh, the, the propagation speed of, of infrasound waves in the atmosphere is usually around 340 meters per second. Uh, that slows down as you get uh, into a colder atmosphere, but that's the typical wave speed. Uh, so that equates to about uh, the wave can travel 20 kilometers in, in about a minute. Uh, so it is, it is about an order of magnitude slower than seismic propagation. Um, but because the, the atmosphere is such a simple uh, or homogeneous medium compared to seismic, that sound can propagate uh, long, long distances. So in some cases, hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. Uh, and we take advantage of that and using infrasound as a monitoring tool. Um, and this may be obvious, but infrasound isn't affected by clouds or, or night um, or anything like that. So uh, it's a really a, a, a good 24 seven monitoring tool. Um, of course, infrasound is affected by, infrasound is produced by other things like storms, uh, wave action, the ocean, um, wind interacting with mountains. Um, yeah, wind is the, is the biggest one that we, that we fight in trying to understand what's a volcanic signal and what's noise. Um, and then, so in terms of volcano infrasound and what can I, what can it tell us? Uh, and I, I put this little scale on the left from things that we're doing now and we're doing really well uh, to things that we're working on. And so, you know, fundamentally, what infrasound can tell us is it can discriminate uh, between whether or not something is coming out of the vent, has an explosion occurred or not. Um, you know, this, this is like the most basic monitoring tool. Um, but then, you know, sort of increasing in complexity, it can tell us when an eruption started, whether it's still going on, uh, the duration of an eruption. And these are important for things like uh, input parameters into uh, transport modeling and fallout. Um, it helps us quantify source parameters like mass flow rate. Um, it can I help identify changes in the, the intensity or the style of an eruption, um, particularly in the midst of an eruption. Uh, so it is really a, a real-time monitoring tool. More and more it's being integrated with seismic. Um, which provides you know, improved 
eruption source and wave propagation information. Um, as other tools, remote sensing tools are coming online and are available more quickly, uh, satellite remote sensing and lightning, these can be integrated with infrasound uh, to provide greater insights into what's actually going on at the volcano. Uh, a, good, a good example of this uh, was during the 2016-2017 the eruption of Bogosloft, which produced a lot of lightning. Uh, and then more recently, the Kalud eruption in uh, Indonesia. Uh, now, now sort of getting down into the list of the, the things that we're working on or things that we, that we want to work on, um, eruption forecasting. You know, typically infrasound has been a detection tool, not a forecasting tool, but at open vent volcanoes, there now have been a few case studies uh, that have shown that it does seem to be possible to detect subtle changes, uh, and this is typically associated with uh, degassing or the movement of uh, magma in an open conduit um, that will allow you to do relatively short-term forecasting uh, using infrasound. Uh, and then finally, sort of detecting, tracking, and characterizing surficial flows, uh, so lahars, landslides, uh, pyroclastic flows, and even lava flows. This is becoming uh, increasingly feasible with the, the instruments and the, the codes, the algorithms that process infrasound. Um, so these, yeah, this is kind of the, the list of things that we can do and that we want to be able to do with infrasound. Uh, in, the, in the United States, there are now four uh, different volcano observatories or four different areas uh, where infrasound is being used. It's widely used, of course, in Alaska at the Alaskan Volcano Observatory. Um, it's also being used in the, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. There's, we have an array uh, in the CNMI. There's also arrays at the Cascade Volcano Observatory and at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Uh, so it's, it's being pretty widely used now across the, the, the USGS. Um, but I'm mostly gonna focus on Alaska um, for obvious reasons. And this is the, this is just a map of all the, the eruptions um, or all the volcanoes with confirmed eruptions since the 1700s. Those are the red triangles and then uh, Holocene volcanoes, the yellow triangles. And it, it's about 60, 65 uh, volcanoes that span about 1500 kilometers along the arc. Um, a lot of these are islands, they're remote. Uh, as I, you can see here, ABO is up here in, in Anchorage. So we're, you know, this is really remote monitoring for most of these volcanoes. And we, we don't have seismic networks uh, on many of these volcanoes. So we rely on remote uh, monitoring techniques um, and more and more infrasound is becoming uh, one of our main techniques for, for monitoring these volcanoes. Uh, of course, in Alaska, uh, I probably don't have to tell all of you this, but the primary hazard uh, is ash and aviation. Oops, sorry. Uh, there aren't many communities that are close enough to active volcanoes uh, that things like pyroclastic flows or lava flows are really a hazard. Uh, Ashfall is a hazard in some communities, but the, the, ma the major hazard, hazard is ash at, at flight levels. Uh, and Tip in a, but in, yeah, there, this is sort of a, a pre COVID number, but um, prior to the COVID 19 uh, pandemic, there were usually about 50,000 passengers per day transiting the North Pacific. Uh, I don't know what that number is now, but it, I'd be curious to know. It's probably, um, I don't know, 10,000, maybe less. Um, and so typically, uh, there are 10 to 12 days per year where ash reaches flight levels in Alaska. That's just the average, I think, over the past 30 years. Um, so what we want to do is be able to detect with infrasound uh, or any method 
when is a big eruption occurring and is ash getting to flight levels? Uh, and so one of our main tools is uh, these arrays that um, infrasound arrays that we have spread out over the, the arc. And so here I'm showing in the, the green stars our current uh, AVO infrasound arrays. We have six arrays spread out over the arc. Uh, and we have plans for two more. We had plans for one in the far western Aleutians uh, out here on Amchika Island. However, um, because of COVID, we're not able to do field work that far west this year. So instead, we're hoping to install this array uh, in the next month or so on the Kenai Peninsula that would cover these, these Cook Inlet volcanoes that are closest to Anchorage. So uh, what, do the, what does an AVO array uh, look like? This is an example, just a Google Earth shot of the six elements in, a, in an array on Adak Island. This is our, currently our westernmost island. Uh, it's about uh, 1,000 kilometers, 900 kilometers from Anchorage. Um, as you can see, it, it does have air service. Uh, so we, we are trying to put our regional, what we're calling regional infrasound arrays uh, in places that are easy to get to with commercial aviation. Uh, so a place where we don't have to hire a ship or a boat to access. Uh, currently, the, the arrays in Alaska all have between four and six elements. Uh, so for, between four and six sensors that make up one array. And the spacing between those sensors is typically 50 to about 120 meters. Uh, in Alaska, there's not much vegetation. Um, as you can see, this photo in the Aleutians, it's typically just uh, grasses. And so we don't, we want to control the wind noise. And we, we have begun using these uh, domes. We call them, it's, a, it's a, basically a mesh aluminum dome. Uh, that reduces the wind noise. It sits over the sensor uh, and reduces the wind noise. And if you can see here, the, this is an example of a sensor, a plot, a, po a power spectral density plot uh, for a sensor here in black that's sitting outside the wind dome. And then in blue, this is the sensor inside the wind dome. So this is a, like an 8 uh, dB decrease in just the background wind noise by putting this dome, uh, this, this basically wind filter over the sensor. So uh, we are now outfitting all of our arrays in Alaska with these wind domes. But if you have thick vegetation or a forest and you can put the array in the forest, uh, it can act very similarly like a, a wind filter. Um, as I mentioned, this is, you know, infrasound is now a, a primary tool for rapid detection of explosive eruptions in Alaska. And we send all of the, our infrasound data to IRIS. So it's publicly available. Uh, a, a big question is always like, well, why do we need an array? Uh, why can't we just install one or put out one sensor? You know, it's cheaper, it's easier. Array is difficult, it takes up a lot of space. You have to run cables. Um, and the advantage of an array is that it provides a direction to the source of sound. Uh, in addition, it provides the wave speed of, so this is an example of an array. So the, the way an array works is that as a sound wave passes, you know, from your source, as a sound wave passes the elements of the array, there's a small time difference in arrival uh, between each element. And so we, what we do is we cross correlate and get that, that time difference between all the elements and then we invert those time differences to get a slowness vector. And from that, for a plane wave crossing the array. And then from that slowness vector, we can calculate the back azimuth or the direction that that sound came from uh, and, and the velocity that that wave is sweeping across the array at. Uh, and so those things. Those are really powerful things, and, and uh, there's a good code base to do those things automatically. Uh, so this is why we use arrays, because we can get that information, which is critical, um, you know, separating a real source from noise 
automatically, and that's what we want to do. Uh, and then this becomes the basis for things like our infrasound alarms. Uh, when we're designing arrays in Alaska, because uh, well, you know, we can talk about local versus regional, but in Alaska, most of our arrays are regional, which means they're more than 15 or 20 kilometers from the volcanoes. Um, and when you start to get outside of 15 or 20 kilometers from the volcano, um, because as, uh, as sound propagates away from the source, it tends to be refracted upward in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's because the, the atmosphere you know, is, is colder as you go upwards. So the sound is refracted upwards and that can lead to shadow zones around or outside of about 20 kilometers. Um, and so what we do in Alaska is we, uh, and I think Hans Schweiger is, is on this call. Um, Hans has come up with uh, this, this software that, that models the regional infrasound propagation. So we can model uh, during different times of the year because the depending on the time of the year, the, the atmospheric winds change, and that changes how sound propagates at, at distances of uh, you know, 20 to 250 kilometers or more. Uh, and so we, we model that, and we can understand whether a proposed location for an array is good during different times of the year, whether we expect uh, infrasound arrivals, at certain locations during different times of the year or not. Uh, and this is an example of, of one of these forward models of infrasound propagation uh, for a source. So you can pick a volcano, um, the code gets the, the atmospheric weather conditions for uh, from zero kilometers up to 140 kilometers in the atmosphere, uh, and then generates uh, this, this 2D image and basically what it's showing here is how much transmission loss or how much signal uh, will be lost due to propagation from this source at this time. Uh, so areas that are in the warmer colors are more likely to get a uh, infrasound detection, cooler areas less likely. So in this case uh, these pink circles are AVO infrasound arrays uh, here, 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 and here. Uh, and so these ones west of the volcano, south and west, would be very unlikely to get a detection if there was an eruption at this time. Uh, while these ones to the east and to the north would be more likely to detect that eruption. Uh, in addition, so th this is a tool called AVO G to S, uh, and Hans automatically runs these for all of our restless volcanoes in Alaska. So if an eruption happens, we can quickly look uh, or if a, if a volcano becomes restless, we can look and see whether it's likely or unlikely that a certain array will detect uh, an infrasound or an explosive event if it happens. Uh, yeah, and then locally, there are problems with actually being too close to the volcano. Um, that's usually not a problem in Alaska. Um, and then topography, you have to consider that if you have steep, uh, topography between the array and your source, it may block that sound. So that's just something to consider uh, if you're putting arrays locally. Uh, and yesterday, Hans uh, was nice enough to run two of these uh, forward models for Reventador. So this is this was if there was an eruption at Reventador uh, yesterday, what would the propagation look like? So the top plot is at zero. This is a, a single frequency. Uh, so this is at 0 0.5 hertz, and this is at 0 0.1 hertz. Uh, so you can see that um, I'm guessing there are strong winds out of the east uh, because you're getting good propagation to the west, um, but really bad propagation to the east. So if, if you had an array in this area, you'd probably be very unlikely to pick up uh, sound from or infrasound from an eruption of Reventador. Um, but if you had a, an array uh, to the south or to the west, it would be more likely. And then if the eruption was 
lower frequency, uh, it would be more likely to radiate sound in, in all directions. Any questions about that? That's John, I have a question. What um, what characteristics of the eruption would get it into that lower frequency category most commonly? It's just the, the size, the energetics. Um, so little strumble interruptions, you know, they're usually not producing 10 second energy, um, but a subplenian or a plenty interruption uh, would produce that like much lower frequency energy. What about like a volcanian explosion sort of readout style somewhere oh, in the yeah. middle? Yeah, if it, if it was a large yeah. volcanian eruption, yeah, certainly it produces uh, lots of low frequency energy. Um, but, but kind of open vent, you know, more strombolian style um, probably wouldn't. John, I have a question. Can you use those uh, forward models of the atmosphere to take sound pressure recorded at regional distances to then like reduce it down to uh, like a local pressure to get at eruption dynamics if you're just recording regionally, like hundreds of kilometers away? I think that, yeah, that's a good question. The, the problem is that the, the atmospheric uh, results are still pretty coarse, so it's it's kind of hard to get at how exactly how exactly that atmosphere. This is something we we struggle with a lot uh, during the writing up the Bogusloff special issue um, because the the regional models, the global uh, weather models are really good but the, the, the spacing is coarse. The regional models are not so good. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd be hesitant to, to try to apply this to sort of a, an actual pressure, ac the actual effect on the pressure um, as far as making a correction you know, for the wind or for the propagation. That's where we want to get to, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the atmospheric specifications just aren't quite good enough yet. OK, thanks. Yeah. OK, so sort of continuing on array design, uh, the question, there's always this question of, well, how many sensors can I get away with? Or how many sensors do I need? Um, of course, for an array, the, the minimum to get a direction is three, uh, but the, there's usually, sorry, uh, there, are usually, there are huge error problems with a three element array. Uh, so the minimum that we suggest is four, um, but if you have five or six, you really reduce the effects of spatial aliasing. If you have you know, if you're looking over multiple frequencies, uh, it really improves the array response. Uh, and here's an example uh, from the Akmak array in Alaska. So the, the red elements were the original four element um, infrasound array. And then uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to, to expand it to a six element array. And so then these yellow elements were the two additions. And if you, if you, we can, uh, we have some codes that do the, that model the array response based on the location and the frequencies that you're interested in. And so you can see here, we're looking uh, at this four element array, the left uh, rose plot, this is azimuthal uncertainty. So it's six and a half or seven uh, degrees of uncertainty for the four element array. Uh, and then a pretty wide, uh, uncertainty in the trace velocity. This is in kilometers per second. Um, however, when you add those two elements, so now you have a six element array, you can see it really greatly reduces the azimuthal uncertainty in the array. 
uh, as well as the trace velocity uncertainty. So, you know, in addition to improving the azimuthal uncertainty and the trace velocity uncertainty, it also adding more elements reduces uh, noise or improves the signal to noise. Um, and it just adds redundancy. Um, you know, in Alaska, it's the most expensive thing isn't the array or installing the array, it's getting to the array typically. Uh, so, you know, if we lose, if we have a six element array, we can lose one or two elements and still be able to get a back azimuth. Um, and we might not be able to visit that array during winter, so we might have to wait several months. So uh, it's really important for us to have that redundancy built in. And then uh, the nice thing about the array is, is that we have these uh, really pretty mature codes now that uh, automatically process the data and provide uh, these plots that, that anyone in the observatory can access and look to see what's going on with, uh, with any volcano. So this is just a screenshot sorry, uh, of this least squares beam forming or this array processing code. Uh, this runs automatically every 10 minutes. Um, this code's freely available. Um, anyone can use it. It's a, it's a Python code. And what it, what it does is it, it does the array processing and then it outputs uh, a waveform, this MCCM, which is the, the maximum cross correlation, uh, sorry, the mean cross correlation maximum. So it, it's the average of all the cross, the maximum cross correlation values between the array element pairs. Uh, so these low values tell you that it's probably just some noise happening. And then when you get these high values, that, that tells you that you have a well-correlated signal crossing the array. Uh, it also outputs the trace velocity. So when you have trace velocities sort of in this gray box between uh, 280 and about 430 uh, meters per second, those are realistic infrasound propagation velocities. So if you see velocities outside of that, you know that that's probably uh, not a signal of interest. Uh, and then the bottom plot is showing us the, the back azimuth uh, from zero to 360. And what we do is we, for each array, we have volcanoes of interest and we can plot those, the back azimuth from the array to that volcano of interest. And that's what we're showing here. So this is Makushin, Cleveland, Akmak, and Bogoslav. So in this case, we, we get, there's some background noise, and then we have this signal of interest. It's well correlated. Uh, it has a reasonable trace velocity, and it's more or less coming from the direction of Bogoslav volcano. So then we can be reasonably confident that, yes, Bogoslav volcano is producing this signal. Uh, and this, this is updated every 10 minutes. Uh, and we found that, this tool is pretty intuitive. Um, now it's essentially everyone in the observatory understands how to use this tool and can go to it quickly, access the data, uh, and have a look and see if, if something is showing some sign of unrest or maybe is an eruption. That, that same array processing code is also the basis for automated alarms. Uh, so this code doesn't doesn't send out alarms. It's just running and putting this information onto a web page. Then we have uh, another version of this. It's the same code essentially, but it's it's running in shorter time windows. Uh, and if it sees, if, so we have a, cer a certain set of parameters that we set up. Um, so, for instance, um, this d azimuth. That's how many degrees off of the actual volcano the, the signal is. Um, there's some range of velocities that we set up and then some pressure threshold. And if all those are, um, if all those trigger, then this code sends out an email and text alert to whoever is signed up uh, to get those messages. So this is 
you know, this, as far as uh, situational awareness, this is a, a really important part of our um, alarm structure for uh, monitoring volcanoes in Alaska. And this, this really lets us, um, you know, now everyone is remote, so everyone's at home, but, you know, we can get these notifications on our phone uh, and then, you know, it, it tells you to go look at the computer and, and see what's going on at, at any given volcano. Uh, again, these are, these are open source Python codes that are pretty easy to, to set up and get running once you have array data. Uh, and now more and more, as we, what we're doing is updating all of our stations in Alaska from analog to digital. And as we do that, we're adding uh, single infrasound sensors that are co-located with seismic. Um, in some cases, we're adding just one or two sensors per network, but in volcanoes that are particularly active, we're adding three to six sensor um, three to six sensors that, that become a, a network, a local network around those volcanoes. Um, of course, these, because of this a network configuration requires some different tools. So we're developing tools, uh, for instance, to, to be able to locate uh, the sources of sound in networks automatically. Uh, this is an example from Shisheldon Volcano. This uses a, a method called reverse time migration. Um, it's basically just back propagating the source to get the, the location. The, in this case, the, the green dot is the vent and the star is the location from uh, these three stations. So the, this isn't, uh, this is a sort of more of a research tool, um, but we're working towards having automated infrasound uh, event location um, as part of the, the AVO automated processing codes. Uh, and then with just a single co-located seismic and infrasound sensor, you can do things like look at the, the coherence of the signal between the infrasound and seismic. Um, this is an example, again, from Shisheldon Volcano. Uh, and the, this, this plot is showing the coherence at different frequencies. And when the coherence is high, you know that the, the volcano uh, is, or that signal is likely uh, a real signal and not just some noise. Uh, and sometimes it, you know, it can be difficult to tell um, a real signal. Th these are pretty obvious, but on a single infrasound sensor, it can be really difficult to tell uh, a signal from just a burst of wind. Uh, so th this coherence method um, is very useful for identifying signal from noise if you just have a single seismic and infrasound sensor. Uh, and then through VDAP, we're starting to expand the use of infrasound uh, internationally. Uh, the, I think the, the VDAP's now providing equipment, uh, the, the software that the, the USGS is using, uh, some training and then analytical support. Um, the, the first big example of this was in 2018 after the, um, the, the major eruption of Fuego Volcano. And uh, we installed uh, multiple arrays around uh, different lahar channels or drainages to, to try and detect and track lahars. Uh, and that work is ongoing. Um, as I mentioned, that, that's sort of on the, the cutting edge of what we want to be able to do. Uh, we also installed a, a six element array that's been really useful uh, to Insabume for tracking activity at Fuego. And uh, Insabume in Guatemala is using the, the USGS iPensib software operationally now, and, and they're getting some uh, pretty interesting results, pretty exciting. Uh, in Peru, we also visited Peru in 2018, and uh, the Geophysical Institute there is using iPensive, the iPensive software for array processing. Uh, and we had planned to install an array at Ubinas this year, but that, of course, is, uh, got put on hold because of COVID. But uh, I think there's, there's strong interest um, in Peru for installing more infrasound. 
Uh, and it sounds like in Ecuador as well, that there's interest. Uh, of course, even the IG has had infrasound for, for some time. Uh, yeah, so just to summarize, uh, you know, now infrasound has really become sort of a mature tool, um, sort of equal to seismic for, for monitoring. Uh, there's been really major growth across the USGS in the last 10 years or so, um, and just the number of stations, the, the quality of the sensors, um, and now a lot of, most of the data now is going to IRIS so, so other people can access that data and look at it. Um, yeah, lots of opportunities to collaborate. Uh, and then there's this, this growing open source code base that really makes uh, analyzing these events uh, much easier. You know, in the past it was pretty difficult. Um, everyone had their own code, but now that uh, these codes have become easily, uh, you know, they're all Python based, easy to share, uh, and people respond when you have questions and they're, they're really pretty easy to set up. 